Tonight we're going to be covering this subject that is very wide and it has caused all kinds of issues. Uh, and the more I read, the more I seek to understand, uh, the more uh, I see the need to concentrate. And that is, I'm going to be talking tonight about teens, uh, about teens and for teens and uh, uh, for us parents to understand as well. And even if our own children are already past teenagers and gone, uh, there's always teenagers in the church, uh, people that we need to help. So just know that um, this is uh, for them and about them, and hopefully it'll be a, a, a big help. So uh, we've gone over uh, issues in the family, of course. Uh, you know, father and mother, husband, wife, before God, before each other. We focused on the uh, fathers in particular, mothers in particular, parenting in general, parenting in specific situations, uh, and all that is on you know the, the previous uh, lessons and the videos. Tonight we're going to again concentrate on teens, and what I want to do is first talk about understanding teens, and obviously, just like with everything else, this is not exhaustive, this is not complete, uh, but at least gives us some handles that we can <clears throat> talk about and go over. Then I want to have some words for teens, and you can channel them over to the video when, uh, if you know of any that would be uh, helped uh, by this. So first, understanding teens. There's much, much there that uh, is just overwhelming sometimes at times. So here we go. Understanding teens. First, one of the things that we need to know is that there's a, a frightening change uh, in teenagers' outer world, in their outer world. That is, their physical being and all that's happening. When people, when uh, young men and women, uh, preteens, are there and then puberty hits, all kinds of changes occur that can be frightening. Their bodies, of course, are going through tremendous change. And... Uh, <laughs> whether it's the voice on young men or pubic hair or what have you, uh, it's there. Uh, and they can be kind of scary as the body goes through those changes. Their circle of uh, uh, friends, their social circles, are expanding rapidly. In junior high and high school and new friends and new schools or this or that, and it can be frightening because this little clicks everywhere, and who's going to like me, who's not going to like me. Uh, they're much more self-conscious about what's happening on the outer world, and it can be very, very frightening for them. And uh, we need to understand them. If you and I, as adults, can be afraid of going into a new party or new home or new friends, like imagine them. They have no experience. And so we need to be very aware that it's frightening changes in the teen's outer world. Then, of course, there's frightening changes that are happening on the inner world, on the inside. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, going to from 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14 and 15, and so forth. What do they begin to be aware? They begin to be aware, much more aware of the fallen world can be kind of scary. Mom and dad are not what I thought they were. They're not God. They're not perfect. They have, they have sin. Um, teachers, coaches, they begin to see, wait a minute, no, that's not right. Uh, even though they may not be able to articulate it. Uh, they, so they're more and more aware of the fallenness of the world, and that means that their disappointments as teens are multiplied and intensified as they see the fallenness of their parents, of their adult world, and the fallenness of themselves, the disappointment, uh, they grow in number and intensification. And they don't know what, what to do with that. How do, you, how do you deal with that? 
And so it's very frightening with them. And, and if nobody's helping them, it, it can be awful. Turn to Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13. And verse 12. Proverbs 13, 12. Says this. Hope deferred. And when, you know, a girl or a boy, they're... 10, 9, 10, 11, they're hopeful, they're joyful, they do all kinds of things, but then they begin to see the fallenness and their hope begins to die. Uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so here they are with greater and greater disappointments, trying to find some happiness, maybe in this and that and this or that and this other, and that, but they're short-lived. And so, again, the disappointments multiply and intensify for uh, teenagers at, that, at that, that age. Then, of course, because of all that, there's fear of failure and rejection. The teenagers fear tremendously the, that they're going to fail and they're going to be looked dumb and uh, they're going to be rejected. Uh, if you remember, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to Timothy, don't let anybody look down on your youthfulness. But look at, let them look at your behavior, your attitude, your godliness. Go by that rather than whether you're proficient, whether you know everything and so forth. No, no. Um, but there is that fear for the teenagers, uh, fear of rejection, fear of failure, and so forth. Then, now what also happens at puberty for, for teenagers their longings intensify, incredibly intensify. And so, but there's no uh, sense of fulfillment. So again, the frustrations inside of teenagers is, my goodness. So then because of that, those longings are intensified and there's no fulfillment, then um, loneliness uh, can get to the point of desperation. And that desperation is pretty common around teenagers, right? Uh, because they have tremendous, intense longings and yet no fulfillment. And because of that, then there is the sexual pressure and the temptations and shame. All those things are magnified. So then all these things are happening. There can, they, there's a, a weirdness, a, an awkwardness that they can feel among their friends, with their parents, what to say, what not to say. Uh, uh, so I better be quiet, not say anything because I'm going to get myself in trouble. No, I'm supposed to talk. Uh, and all these intense things inside, it is no wonder that at times teens just rah, burst out in rage and anger. It's all building up like a volcano. And we adults, we parents need to understand and have great patience with all that. I, I, I remember myself getting myself in tr all kinds of trouble and not even understanding why. Not even understanding why. Um, and all this is happening with them. And there's more. All this is understanding teenagers. And as I said, this is not exhaustive. It's just I'm going down the list of, of realities of our teens. And then something else is happening with the teens at that point. There are demands on them. There are demands on them. So here's a list of demands. Number one, teenagers are expected to know without looking stupid. They're supposed to know everything. They're supposed to know all things. Even by their own peers, there's pressure. And it can be something as dumb as the latest music, the latest lyrics, the latest movie, the latest restaurant, the latest whatever. And if the teenager doesn't know, that he's going to look stupid. So ah, here we go. And then they have to pretend that they know everything. On the other hand, if they don't, we better hide because I don't know. I'm going to look stupid. And so there's a demand for them to know and not look stupid. Um, here's another thing with teenagers. There's a demand. In some ways, the teen teenagers feel like they need to provide, uh, to perform 
without having the resources or experience. In, uh, cur in the recent history, teenagers have been put in the place of fulfillment for the parents. Somehow the parents have made the teenagers their all in all, or their young people. They got to make them happy. They got to be successful. They got to look. And, and so then the teens feel like, oh man, I'm under pressure to, to do be, be everything perfect because my parents are depending on me. Their happiness is depending on me. And then if parents are going through uh, hard times in their marriage or even divorce, the, the, the teenagers say, oh, it's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. I need to provide for my parents happiness. And without knowing it, without even being aware of it, parents have so concentrated on the teens, and the teens feel the pressure to perform, to provide, to be there for the parents, so that the parents don't go nuts. <laughs> and there's a demand on them in that way. Uh, and they don't have the resources nor the experience. So they need to know everything, perform, Provide, and then they're supposed to be self-sufficient in, in the relational jungle, right? They have to uh, be self-sufficient in the relational jungle, and it is a relational jungle. We as adults know that to be true. Can you imagine among teens? And now we have all kinds of issues sexually, right? Uh... Homosexuality, bisexuality, and all these gender identities and all this stuff. Like, oh my goodness, how do you make sense of all of that? Right? And so how do you relate? You accept, don't accept. Be okay, not be okay. Uh, uh, all these different ways. It's a jungle out there. And everybody's making fun of everybody else. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be made fun of. The teenagers are just like on edge so much of the time. And if we don't understand, we're going to try and force them to behave and understand everything, and it's just like more pressure on them. That's why I suspect sometimes when I walk around and teenagers, you know, I, you know, I look at them, they don't want to look at me. They don't want to look at me. <laughs> like, they're going to think that I'm expecting something from them, that I need them. I don't, you know, in the way that they need to provide something for me. No. Like everybody else, we all want friendships. We all want to be kind to one another, right? But so many teenagers, they won't even look you in the eye anymore. I'm supposed to behave a certain way. I'm supposed to make a joke or something. I'm supposed to this. I'm... No, but that's the way they feel. You see, that's what they were experiencing. And so we, we have that demand on them. Even if it's not articulated, that's what they feel. Uh, they have to be self-sufficient in this relational jungle. And we ourselves as adults many times don't even know what we're doing. Our own relationships are in a mess. And yet we expect our teenagers to know how to relate. Pretty sad. And we also need to understand that the teenagers are just like all other human beings. They are made in the image of God and they are fallen. And we need to understand those two realities. Right? They're made in the image of God. It's at work. And this, the, the fact that our teenagers are made in the image of God gives them dignity. Gives them dignity. Meaning, we need to treat them with, uh, uh, that they have knowledge, that they have brains, that they have emotions, leg legitimate feelings, uh, that they long for things to work right and so forth. They have a passion for love and to be loved, just like all of us, right? Our teenagers have the passion for love and to be loved. Our teenagers have the passion to be, be recognized for something. You want to be recognized. I want to be recognized. They want to be recognized. Legitimately so, like everybody else, you see? They have significance. They're important. And they have that passion for that. <clears throat> the teenagers have the passion for things to work the way they're supposed to. How do you and I respond when our car won't work? When the refrigerator dies? When there's a leak in the roof? 
and you've paid a trillion dollars to get your roof right? <laughs> you know, ah, we just lose it. Well, guess what? Our teenagers, when things don't work right, they also get frustrated because they long for things to work the way they're supposed to, you see. Um, but then also, that's all the fact that our teenagers are made in the image of God, right? It said work in them. But then our teenagers also, like everybody else, have a fallen heart, a fallen everything about them. Uh, it, that's also at work, depravity. There's pride. And how do you deal with pride? Our teenagers have pride, self-sufficiency. I'm going to do it myself, thank you very much. Get out of my way. Don't talk to me. <laughs> like, reminds me of me. <laughs> if we're honest about it, if we're honest about it, how often and how, how easily are you and I thrown off? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Don't you dare tell me what to do, especially if you're younger than me or you're the opposite sex. <laughs> it's our pride, right? Well, guess what? Our teenagers have the same problems. Um, I want to do it myself. Turn to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. And this is not just, obviously, not just for uh, our teenagers. That's for all of us. And here is a problem for all human beings, and it's there with the teenagers as well. And some of you, because I've talked to you on a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, will remember this passage. Uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind, who makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Right? So what does that mean? Three things there. Uh, trust in mankind makes flesh his, flesh, uh, his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Three things, right? Trust in mankind. What does that mean? Mankind, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my husband, my wife, my children, my parents, my friends, people, 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 trust in mankind. They have what my soul needs to live. Trust in mankind. They have my security. They have my respect. They have my dignity. They have my manhood. They have my womanhood. They have my everything, everything. People, 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 people. Trust in mankind. Makes flesh his strength. What does that mean? That means I have the whereabouts, I have the resources to get it from them. What do I have? My tears. My beautiful body, my money, my looks, my personality, my ability to lie, my ability to, to demand, to boss around, to uh, use my emotions, use my whatever to get what I want from them, to get from human beings, right? Trust in mankind makes flesh his strength. And the third one is a logical step. Because once I'm involved in that system, people, 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 my wife, my husband, my children, my parents, my friends, they have what I need, and I have the whereabouts to get it from them. Who needs God? Whose heart turns away from the Lord. That's what it says there, right? And our teenagers are infected with that disease, as we all are. And how does the Bible, how does that verse start? Thus, says the Lord. <laughs> God says what follows. It's not a psychiatrist, psychologist, a scientist, a bioethicist, a president, a queen, a professor, a guru. Thus says the eternal God. And what does he say? Cursed is the man. Point. He's doomed. You use this system of looking to people and your own research to get from people what you need. It's doomed. <laughs> it will not succeed. It's, it's in vain. Try a million times. It's not going to work. Right? Cursed is the man. And what's the experience for teenagers, for all of us, when we have under that system, verse 6, for he will be like a bush in the desert. 
and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in the stony waste in the wilderness, in a land of salt without inhabitants. Lonely, 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 lonely. A teenager can be surrounded by a thousand friends and still be super lonely. And you and I can remember the same thing. We can be at a party. We can be at all kinds of stuff, but inside we feel lonely. And that's the experience, right? And that's going on through the teenagers when they feel self-sufficiency, a demand to be self-sufficient, and so forth. And then what do they end up using? Or doing, like all other human beings, they begin to misuse creation. Misuse creation, right? And um, is uh, a rock out there, just a rock, regular stone, is it more valuable than, let's say, a donkey? No, the donkey is a lot more valuable. The rock. But a donkey may be used, right? How about a uh, race horse, a thoroughbred? Is it more valuable than a donkey? Oh, uh, yeah. You take a thoroughbred, you can make millions and millions of dollars, right? Uh, I mean, you can go on the value scale up and up and up in creation, right? And what's the highest of creation? The highest value? Human beings. That's the highest. So teenagers, just like everybody else, are going to use all of creation to get what they want. And they will use other human beings to get what they need, like us as adults. Romans 1, verse 21 and following, they left God, even though they knew about God, and this happens with teenagers as well. Romans 1, verse 21 and following. And uh, <clears throat> started using creatures, right? To try and fulfill what only God can fulfill. And teenagers have the same, same problems. So as parents, in parenting, because we're talking about the family, right? As parents, we need to be constantly parenting with patience, with a lot of patience, a lot of patience, uh, pursuing their heart. And, of course, you see the movies and how teenagers are, don't even talk to me. They lock themselves in their room and come out 10 days later <laughs> or something, you know what I mean? Uh, we need to pursue them with a lot of patience. And some of you might remember being a teenager yourself, those of, you that are, those of us that are older, and remember the agony of being alone and not being pursued, not being understood. Um, but we as parents to pursue their hearts with a lot of patience. Uh, teenagers, they need to hope in God. They need to hope in God's faithful work. The teenagers need to be drawn to God's faithful work. Uh, work. Now, uh, all that is kind of basic, of course. So let me go through some uh, current teen cultural issues. Okay? Current teen cultural issues that has kind of in our generation has come up uh, that we need to be very, very aware in order to understand our teens and help our teens love our teens. And uh, I've gotten this from this book, um, The Disappearance of American Adult, uh, Ben Sass, S-A-S-S-E. Uh, it's a great book. You must read. Uh, it's, a, it's a great book. But, and these are not in order, and these are as I thought about it myself. So here's, here's number one. Uh, generational segregation. What do I mean by that? Uh, the... Uh, Teenagers more and more are separated from the older folks. It used to be where the teenagers were around the dinner table a lot. They were around the aunts and uncles, and they heard the stories of the older people, and they gained wisdom. Well, no more. No more. 
in the past century or less than a century, uh, the schools more and more put teenagers apart from their parents. The teenagers are no longer working with the parents in the farm or uh, in a, as an apprentice or whatever. No, now it's school, 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 and they stay away from the parents, stay away from the parents. And now teenagers spend more time with teenagers their own age than anybody else. And they do not get to hear the wisdom and struggles and and, and difficulties that the parents have gone through, all the people have gone through. They don't hear about that. So they're kind of left to themselves, so to speak. And that generational segregation, a separation of the generations, is a big problem. And um, for teenagers to spend time with older folks is very, very necessary, but very rare this time, these days. And it's very, very sad. Very sad. So that's one of the problems. Uh, here's another one. A de deficient work ethic. Uh, teenagers, uh, because of how they grew up and so forth, work is like, what? You asked me to do what? Take out the trash? Are you kidding me? That's too hard for me. I mean, it's, it's uh, I say it tongue in cheek, but for teenagers to really get to work, I mean, most of us that are older, I mean, I was working picking cotton at six years old. And if I didn't work, if my oldest brother saw me putting my hands on my side to rest, whack, I'd, I'd get a whipping. I had to work, right? Early in the morning before the sun came up to the sundown. And uh, he said, oh, child abuse. <laughs> no, it was just the reality. We were poor and we need to work, right? Can you imagine... Huh, having a teenager work in the fields, two hours. Oh, my goodness. Child abuse. Call Child Protective Services. It's, and you know, it's, it's amazing. It's crazy. But so our teenagers, there's a work, a deficient work ethic. To be able to work hard with your hands, to produce that's kind of gone. Let me just kind of use my brain a little bit and everything's easy, quick, click, 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 click. And uh, don't push me because the clicking can get awfully tiring, so don't push me. It's like, what? Uh, we're no longer producing. Teenagers are more consuming. And it's a big problem. And it's our cultural situation. Because we were uh, very affluent, we have so much in abundance that is no a fault of their own in, in, in the sense of not be having a work ethic because we as parents need to be on saying, how can we? But it takes a lot of energy, right? It takes a lot of energy. So a deficient work ethic, general, generational segregation, that is separation of the ages, of the you know, same age groups, uh, deficient work ethic. And then here's another one. Overly sheltered from pain. Overly sheltered from pain. And so many of our young people, can't, they, they, they have no character. They have no strength. Oh, you know, these microaggressions. I got to have my safe space. Uh, any pain, like, oh, no, because we've sheltered them way, way too much. Uh, so pain is absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable. Take a pill, go to the doctor right away, send to, whatever it takes, get away from pain. And it's way, way too much, so our young people are very weak. Uh, here's another one. Overly sheltered from death. Hmm. Overly sheltered from death. I don't know how many times I've been to the hospital, and the parents, uh, one, the husband or the wife, are in terrible, you know, condition. Oh, no, no, don't bring the children up. Don't bring the children up. And the children don't see the decline of the human experience. We are all going to die. But our young people are shielded from that way too much. You see? 
And so they get the sense like, well, I'm going to live forever. There's no problem of death or problems. I mean, obviously they hear about it, but they don't see it and experience it. Used to be where mom and dad would die at home. And everybody knew there's decline. And it's going to get to the point where we need help. Now, our older generation, our elderly, are dying in nursing homes with nobody visiting them. Right? Shelter the kids. You know, and, and the kids get to the point that, I don't want to deal with that. Are you kidding me? And it's real sad. Because many times our teenagers, our young people, overly sheltered from death. And they begin, they begin to think that they're, they're not going to have to face death. Some scientist, some vaccine is going to deliver me from all the problems. Uh-uh. No. Uh, here's another one. Because there is a segregation from the various generations, and now so much is digital, I can relate digitally. And before I relate digitally, I can spend 10 hours doing my eyelashes before I appear on Facebook. Or I can exactly have all the right things. I can even have filters to take away all my pimples. I can have a filter to put hair on my bald head. I mean, we can do all kinds of things because we only relate through digital media. Teenagers have a hard time really relating. They don't know how to relate. They can't even now tell the facial expressions. How do you interpret that? I don't know. I know how to text. Text, 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 text. Right? But relate face to face? Read emotions? Read faces? No. And we adults don't understand that. And so teens have a hard, hard time relating. Even with each other at times. Uh, so, fear of relating. Fear of relating. Uh, relating to adults? What? You're asking an impossibility. So, just to say hi to an adult. <laughs> I mean, they are. And then, of course, there's a, another problem right now in our generation. It's, uh, it's always been there, only it's been intensified a lot more. A deficient moral compass. There's a deficient moral compass. What used to be like, oh my goodness, that's terrible. That's, now it's like pff, anything goes. Homosexuality, bisexuality, you know, you want to have two or three partners, sure. You know, I'm not going to judge you, don't judge me. And here we go. What's right and wrong? Well, you can kind of make it on by your own. You see? There's a deficiency in the moral compass. Um, uh, here's another one. There's no critical thinking. Our young people, they, they're not taught how to critically think. It's just read here. Now, depending on what it says, now answer this question. Don't think about what it actually says. Just answer this question. Just pass the test. And our young people are not taught how to critically think. Here's the situation. Read this. Now, do you agree with everything or don't you agree? If you do agree, on what basis do you agree? And if you disagree, on what basis do you disagree? Think. No. Nope. It's just, here's the information, now regurgitate it over here. Here's the information, give the answer over here. You don't have to think. Just, you get it from here, see? Oh, yeah. So when things come around, it's like, oh, yeah. That's what the news says. That's what the book says. That's what they told me over here. Well, think, man. Think. But our teenagers not help with that area. So no critical thinking. You see? And it's a, it's a major, major problem. Um, like I said, this is not exhaustive. This is not complete. But those are some things that we can grapple with, that we can wrestle with. So uh, now I'm going to um, say a few things for teenagers. And again, you can just refer the teenagers. I want to say to them, 
this was more about them, but now this is to them directly, to the teenagers, I would say, we all need to say this. Of course, number one, trust and obey the Lord, right? Teenagers, trust and obey the Lord. Uh, because the world is so messed up, it's always has been, but it seems like it's just like, got worse. Uh, Proverbs, the way Proverbs starts, says this was the purpose is the Proverbs of uh, Proverbs chapter one verse one and following Proverbs chapter one verse one and following. Uh, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Here it is. To know wisdom, here's the purpose of Proverbs, to know wisdom and instruction. To discern the sayings of understanding, to kind of like, let me understand. The Proverbs give understanding, right? To give wisdom, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. This can be given to the teen, really to anyone, but to the teen. To give prudence to the naive. The naive are not stupid. They just haven't been trained. They might be very intelligent, but they have just never been taught. Right? To give prudence to the naive. To the youth, knowledge and discretion. You know? To give knowledge and discretion. Knowledge and discretion is of what really matters. You see, not just information you get at school about biology and all the other subjects. No, no, no about what really matters. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, there it is, the fear of the Lord. Here's the beginning of it. Teenagers, here's the beginning of it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the first thing, teens, you really need to respect God. You really need to say God knows better than my own fallen emotions, my own fallen thinking, my own fallen body. God knows better, and I need to give him the understanding and the wisdom, acknowledge the wisdom and understanding, and me submit to him, right? The fear of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 3 and we've, I mean, Proverbs 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your uh, heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so forth. You see? And the Proverbs, teenagers. Teenagers. Trust and obey the Lord. And it's done by faith. It's done by faith because many times our own emotions and our own thinking, we think we got it. We think we know better. No, we don't. We're very poor in all our understanding, very limited in what we know. So it needs to be by faith. Here's another thing. Teenagers, don't fight discipline. Don't Fight it. Um, Proverbs 3, verse 11. Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Right? Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 5. Proverbs 15. Verse 5 says this, A fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. See, do not reject discipline. We all know Ephesians 6.1, uh, Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. Here's number four for the for teenagers. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. Um, when we dishonor, listen to this, and this is for us adults as well, right? 
when we dishonor the source of our being, when we dishonor the source of our being, we are automatically dishonoring ourselves. Right? When we dishonor the source of our being, if we dishonor God, the ultimate source of our being, we're dishonoring ourselves. And when you teenagers dishonor your parents, you're dishonoring yourself. It's no wonder you feel terrible. And then you try and fix that in illegitimate ways. No, honor your father and your mother. Um, Exodus 20, verse 12, one of the commandments. So teenagers, uh, talk with your parents with faith and respect. Address them. Talk to your parents. And if you don't have a parent or parents, talk to those in authority. Uh, a church elder or a coach at school that you see is living upright. Or a teacher, a professor, someone that you respect that sees, you see some godliness there. Ask for help, address them. Uh, and, and, and have faith, teenagers, that God is at work. It's amazing when we seek the Lord and when we do what is right, God will provide for you. God will provide for you. But are you really seeking the Lord? Are you really seeking to honor those in authority? Respect your father and your mother. What does that mean to respect your father and your mother? Because sometimes teenagers, are, teenagers will say, well, they're supposed to respect me. Well, there is a sense in which we're supposed to take care of each other's dignity, right, and not treat each other like animals. But biblical respect means, listen, teenagers, biblical respect means I am giving a higher authority to that person. I am allowing them, I am acknowledging that they have higher authority, more, more authority than I do. That's biblical respect. You see. And so teenagers, respect your parents. Give a heavier authority, more importance to them than to yourself. It may not seem reasonable, but listen, God sees and God knows. Uh, here's another thing, teenagers. Stay teachable and seek understanding in the midst of a fallen world. It's difficult, but teenagers, uh, stay teachable and seek understanding in the midst of a fallen world. Right? And it is fallen. Uh, Psalm 25. Psalm 25. This is a psalm uh, David was being persecuted. Um, he says, to you, O Lord, this is Psalm 25, verse 1, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. In the midst of being persecuted and the enemies were coming after David, David didn't just rebel. No, God teach me in the midst of this fallen world. And teenagers, you need to do the same. Stay teachable and seek understanding. Um, here's another thing, teenagers. And again, for us adults, it also applies. Uh, watch out that you don't hang around those who don't put God as their priority. Don't hang around those who do not put God as their priority. Teenagers, those people may be very fun. Teenagers, those people may be giving you things. And they might just uh, laugh at your jokes and be fun to be around with. But they, if they don't put God first, if they're not seeking after God, let me tell you, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they are fools. That's what they are, fools. Uh, and if I don't hang around, and if I don't put God as number, number one and I put priority on God, I'm a fool. Anybody. So watch out, teenagers, who you hang around with. Uh, Proverbs uh, 
13, and especially teenagers, I mean, this is a, one of those proverbs that I said, man, memorize, underline it, uh, print it, put it in your refrigerator, your bathroom. Uh, remember, 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 remember this one. Proverbs 13, verse 20. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says this. He who walks with the wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. That's the word of God, not mine. You hang around trash, you're going to become trash. You hang around people that, wa that are wise and respect God, guess what? You're going to become wise. Watch out who you hang around with. You know, do they put God? Do they talk about God? Do they bring up God? And if you bring up God, how do they respond? Do they make fun of you? Do they want to continue the conversation? Are they interested? If not, maybe their friendship needs to be very short. Um, watch out who you hang around with. Those who don't put God as priority are fools, the Bible says. Um, now, contrary, seemingly contrary to that, teenagers live life with gusto. Live life with gusto. You know, um, remembering that you will be answering to God for this. But as much as possible, live life with gusto, man. Go for it. I mean, obviously within moral bounds. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes 11. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11, starting in... Verse 9, rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of your young, uh, young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring to judgment all of these things. In other words, live with gusto, but obviously with the good things. You know, those that are pleasant and, and, and uh, uh, morally pure and good things, go for it. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life is are fleeing. By the time you know it, you're going to be this old man creeping around like I am. You do one thing like, oh, no, oh, where's the Bengay? Where's the Tylenol? <laughs> Sooner or later, you're going to be like that. Remove also your, uh, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. The day comes when you will no longer be as free as you are now bodily and enjoy youthfulness. Believe me, the days come. So while you can, enjoy. Enjoy. Go for it. Live with gusto, knowing that there needs to be morality among all that. Teenagers, here's another one. Never stop reading the Bible. All of the Bible, the Psalms and the Proverbs are, are wonderful. Psalms and the Proverbs are, for young people are just wonderful. Psalm 1. Psalm 1 says this. How blessed, uh, the word there is whole. I mean, it's happy, energetic, full of life. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted firmly by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves does not wither. In the, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord 
knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Man, teenagers, meditate on that. Meditate on that. And live by that. My goodness, it will deliver you all kinds of troubles that we adults wish somebody had told us and pointed us to the word of God. Teenagers, don't ever stop reading the scriptures. Asking God for help to understand. Now, here's another one that um, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, but that's okay. Uh, with all that's going on with you teenagers, at the, at the age of being teenagers and puberty comes and you have all these passions and you're told, no! And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's a trap from my perspective. Uh, the greatest, most intense passions come between puberty and early 20s. After that, it starts going downhill. And who designed it that way? Some pervert? No, God did. And yet, during that age, we say, no, no teens, no, no teens, no. I'm burning inside, man. No. What do we do? And then, and then, on top of all that, you have the world's immorality, uh, a tsunami of uh, sexualization. Everything is sexualized. Everything. And no, no. <laughs> like, okay, it's a trap. It is. And when we adults don't understand, then we pressure and demand and do all kinds of things. Now, am I suggesting immorality? No, of course not. But what I would say is this. Teenagers, channel all your passions, all your drives. Listen to this. Listen. Channel all your passions and all your drives to prepare yourself to be the right spouse, to prepare to be a godly wife, to prepare to be a godly husband. So what does a godly husband do? He provides. He has vision. He takes care. He protects. How quickly can you provide for a wife? How quickly can you provide for a, for a family? How quickly are you going to be strong enough to, to protect and to lead? Well, use all your passions, young man, to prepare yourself to be a good husband. And who knows, you might be able to be a good husband at 17, 18, 19 years old. But use all your passions to do that. Because many times we just focus on what's going to make me happy. Video games, video games. Oh, well, how's going to that prepare you to be a good husband? You know? No. And young woman, prepare yourself to be a godly wife. You know, to be nourishing, to be a help to your husband. You know, to be flexible, to, to trust the Lord, to support him. Even when you don't like things, to be able to support with wisdom. That might mean that right now you concentrate on becoming very well as educated as you can. To have a job that you can supplement when you start having children to supplement for your husband. Oh, I know, I know. People are going to say, oh, well, you see, you just want the wife to be pregnant and barefoot. No, the greatest fulfillment for a wife or a woman is to have her children. Because that's God's design, not man-made, no, you see. But to be able to be a godly wife that supports her husband, that's there for him to, to help him carry out what God designed him to do. And you can use all your passions, all your drives to prepare yourself to be a godly wife, not just fulfilling yourself, you see. And so teenagers... There's a lot to consider. All the passions and all the drives. When you puberty hits and we adults and all the frustrations and all the longings and we adults need to be very in tune with that and, and, and pursue with a lot of patience and, uh, and sacrifice. But sacrifice in the right way. 
not just to keep our teens happy. Are they moving in a direction of following God and God's design? So let my life be the proof, the proof of your